Well, welcome everybody. Nice to have you here in person and joining virtually. My name is David Russell Jensen. My ticket name is Shaka Goo. I'm Tate Poi Di, I'm child of the Kwash Kipan and grandchild of the Shuka Kadi. I'm also Sim uh, I am the, I newly joined Sanaska Heritage as the, their development officer and uh, I'm very glad to have everybody here. Um, this is our first time having a lecture uh, live streaming as well as in person, so I hope that there are many things going on online. In recognition of Native American Heritage Month, uh, Sulaska Heritage is hosting a series of lectures on Southeast Alaska Native history. We're have, having lectures on uh, the Russian Klinkit Wars, history of Inksa, the introduction of infectious diseases, the AMD and ANS, Elizabeth Paratovich, William Paul, and other topics. I wanted to say thank you for providing your proof of vaccination for those who are joining in person. Uh, please remain masked for the duration of the lecture. If you are needing to use the restroom, you can find the restrooms upstairs on the second floor. Uh, the lecture today is titled, Tunket Society and the Crucible of Contact, 1741 to 1867. And it's being presented by Dr. Stephen J. Langdon, whose blanket name is Atsuni Yish. That name was given to him by the Kawak Anak Dedi. Uh, Steve Dr. Langdon uh, is Professor of Emeritus of Anthropology at the University of Alaska Anchorage, uh, where he taught for, 30, for 38 years. Dr. Langdon has conducted research products on many public policy issues impacting Alaska Natives, uh, including uh, fisheries, land management, tribal government, cultural heritage, customary trade, and co-management. Dr. Langdon's research focuses on uh, pre, uh, the history and culture of the Tlingit and Hyacinth peoples of Southeast Alaska from pre-contact through the historic period. Uh, and without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Stephen Langdon. Thank you for joining us. semi-dependent. These referred to some uh, of the Central Yupik 
population, particularly some of the southern Dena'ina, uh, uh, with whom there were trade relations established and there were fur, fur, fur trade posts, but the uh, indigenous people were autonomous. They retained their sovereignty and it was in the establishment specifically of the trade that they returned semi-dependent. And then there was the, uh, the, the final category uh, reference, which are the independent, and I would add as well, they were referred to as uncivilized, and these were the Aka people and, of course, the Thicket and the Haida people of southeastern Alaska. So, so certainly that is one of the lecture themes is, why were the Thicket unchanged, uncivilized, and independent when the U.S. asserted jurisdiction in 1867? And the second frame, which is more broad and, and encompassing in terms of the the way of life of the people is uh, what changes did Clinton experience between 1741 and uh, 1867? Well, of course, this covers the new peoples, as we've seen, of various different kinds, new ways of speaking and languages, new, new cultures and ways of doing things all became uh, a part of that contact circumstance. They also received new materials and objects and technologies which were brought into practice, uh, and of course the deadly diseases that uh, seriously impacted populations across the entire region, a regional theme there, and new ideas, often overlooked in the encompassing of new ideas is writing, about which I have written and think an incorporation of script into the society and culture, and of course the ideas associated with uh, religious system of Christianity. So that leads us then to the status of the Tlingit society as of 1767. So Tlingit culture has a defining cultural traits, its maritime orientation, salmon as a major subsistence resource, woodworking in a variety of ways including large communal houses, the matrilineal descent groups, the uh, elaborated stratification system, highly developed property rights, um, trade as a very important feature for wealth generation, uh, potlatch ceremonialism, <clears throat> the distinctive art system shared with the Haida and the, and the Simsian, and a salmon, a critical part of the conceptual system, salmon and other living forms are con conceived of as people with whom relationships are established, and through those relationships, existence is sustained. All of these are, uh, is a, a, a quick overview of Tlingit culture. Now, in southeastern Alaska, we know that there's a human presence through archaeological research. By about 11,000 years ago, we have human remains at 10,600 years ago. Uh, there is a clear maritime adaptation early, as early as 8,200 years ago. And the Clinket present, how assimilated to this, some would contend from, from the time immemorial on down, it is Clinket. But certainly the evidence supports on a linguistic basis a presence of 6,000 years based upon relationships with the interior Diné languages. Uh, and we also have a material object called the Thorn Bay Basket. And the Thorn Bay Basket was an archaeologically discovered in the inner tidal zone of the Thorn River on the east side of Prince of Wales Island, dated to 5,300 years ago. And this particular segment of that basket was analyzed and it demonstrated all of the constructive elements in terms of uh, how you start a basket, the direction that you do it, the twinage, uh, all of the characteristics used to <clears throat> analyze basketry demonstrates that this particular uh, <clears throat> remain was, is the same in terms of technique as that now made by Clinket spruce root basket makers, a very strong principle. <clears throat> Oral traditions from Thinket clans indicate movement into the region. There is not uh, a, a deep time orientation of absolute uh, immemorial presence. Uh, these include movements from the south, from the east down the river valleys, from the north across the glacial fields, and in one case, amongst the uh, Tequidi, an account of an incorporation of a population from across the sea, found on the outer coast of Prince of Wales Island perhaps Japanese um, descendants from some shipwreck. Uh, <clears throat> the Haida moved into southeastern Alaska about 200 years ago. So Clinket society is organized at various levels. One of these levels is in into the Quans, of which there are 13 to 15 such groupings, and that particular status of those was affected in some locations. Uh, the division into the north in terms of linguistic and certain cultural characteristics in the south 
um, that is a distinction. At the time of contact, as just mentioned, uh, Haida Qadas people were immigrating or invading from, uh, from the northern Haida Gwaii elements. Uh, Lincoln Society was expanding northeastward into uh, Canada, into the interior, and along the Gulf Coast it was expanding westward and uh, coming into contact with the Chugachalutik and the Eak people in that vicinity. So the society was dynamic in terms of how things were, were transforming and there were certain processes by which um, these events would be accommodated. Uh, certainly the, the Clinkett cultural template is a very powerful template in its capabilities of assimilating those who are um, oriented towards matrilineal descent specifically. In a, so there, are the the uh, the Quans were divided uh, into sort of geographic, socio-geographic divisions. Uh, in terms of one of the things I'd like to point out here is the outer outer islands groupings and the mainland groupings. These particular orientations provided special resources. So they each had their own resource portfolios, and those in turn provided for exchange that was both east and west on the outer coast to the mainland, and also north to south. One of the central features of the underlying environment is that the, the great productive wood, the red cedar, uh, is not found north of Frederick Sound. So this particular element, and, uh, and from the north, uh, materials such as copper, Made, made trade and the, and the development of the intricacies of trade relations a critical element in Clinkett society. Clinkett social organization was matrilineally positioning an individual such as the, the late Herman Kitka as a Tlingit through his language in a particular moiety uh, in, uh, within the Kwan, the Shitka Kwan. He was through his mother's line, not only in the Moiety, but a particular clan, the Kaguantan. He was born into a house, and he was given personal names, both at birth and then over his life. All of these situated a clinket quite precisely in terms of their uh, social positioning uh, and the understanding of that positioning to others. Social stratification including, included the elites, uh, demonstrated here in this uh, well-known image of Hatlian and next to him um, uh, a female relative wearing the labret. And then um, this, the status is demonstrated through regalia. <clears throat> the labrets were worn by the elite women in association with their relatives and with other retainers. The Clinkett settlement system was organized into winter villages with uh, as much as usually 20 houses in the village, the large village of Kluckwan came to have more with 20 to 40 persons per house. They dispersed to their seasonal resource camps beginning in the spring with the coming of the herring resource. Um, in addition, they also had a number of other physical uh, positionings, including forts, lookouts, refuge areas. Very important feature in the Clinkett settlement system were the ixt burials or the shamanic burials as they represented uh, outposts to provide protection uh, to the communities um, uh, through the powers of the shaman. This uh, is a, uh, the, the village of Cape Fox as it appeared in the 1898 uh, as a, uh, an example of a winter village, the way in which it's configured. In addition, the seasonal resource, ca resource camps were much less uh, uh, built up in that circumstance. There are many forts across, the, across uh, Clinkett region. This fort here uh, we, was uh, visited by the Spaniards in 1779, it has a name, and we uh, did an archeological survey of that site corresponding and uh, discovered that this was, this particular fort site south of Cloac uh, on the west coast of Prince of Wales was uh, over a thousand years old in terms of its use. So that particular dimension in terms of Clinkett society, the militarism and uh, the necessities for defense went on for uh, was, was clearly in place. And this is demonstrated also by, of course, the, the uh, accoutrement associated with, with the uh, military mode uh, opposed in life and the uh, weaponry. Trade, as I mentioned, was a significant practice conducted by the elites, but with an eye towards the status of the entire group. Elites conceived of themselves as trustees, very important. The reason their activities uh, were undertaken was to mobilize the status of themselves and their group together. 
uh, <clears throat> as discussed above, there were those particular kinds of trade practices. Uh, later on, a very important trade was developed that uh, brought the Chilkat into a much more powerful position through their interior trade and the Stikine with the Taltan. A very important feature, particularly for Southern Tlingit, uh, was the NAS trade fair. Uh, and this is, uh, surrounds the great production of Ulican. And the Nass River is located in the northernmost portion of British Columbia. So groups from throughout that region, including the Haida, uh, the Hyaltsuk, and the various uh, um, different Simsian uh, um, <clears throat> groups traveled to that location where they would engage in trading and multiplicity of other activities, the solicitation of particular kinds of resources, establishment of social relationships. Uh, it must have been an extraordinary event. Uh, Clinkets also came um, to, to Sitka in, in large numbers in the spring and associated with the herring tape. So uh, there's never been a discussion of that as a trade fair in the way in which the Nass River trade fair was really conceived of. So, in, in, or, in order to accommodate how then uh, a people approach the world, I have, I have generated the concept of an existence scape. This means what is it possible to think and do within the cultural constructs uh, that people have generated over centuries. So humans receive and generate a stream of sensations. Those sensations are interpreted through both physiological and cognitive processes. Through them, those sensations are given meaning, and the basis of much behavior arise through the mediated processes that rely on concepts and understandings. Uh, these become learned and are the basis for creative engagements, both social and environmental. So existence scapes comprise the realm of possible understandings, behaviors, and creative responses given by a set of core cosmological and ontological principles. They become the embodied habitus of people. This is the way in which your neurological and cognitive system reacts. This is what you learn through your upbringing and through your experiences. So the existence scape of Clinkets is one of willful interdependent beings as, as articulated by Julie Cruikshank, in which there is a relational cosmology with Raven, a relational ontology as in the Salmon Boy story, the building of knowledge or epistemology through relationships, all of which lead to a principle of relational sustainability is the underlying theme, in, and that is through relationships with the natural forms that we interact, based on respect and with the other human forms, we sustain existence. Existence is sustained through these, through this, these uh, actions. Yale's transformations then become central to a Clinket existence scape. The understanding of Yale in terms of how his actions and adventures uh, become a critical way in which an interpretive frame is developed for encounters that are out of the um, ordinary. There, these are many of the different uh, events that uh, Raven encountered in, in his conduct. Um, Added to the understanding of Yech is the three, these uh, three important Klinket concepts, Shuka and Shagun, meaning the relationships with the ancestors and those relationships going forward, At-U, the creation of special, quote unquote, sacred relationships characterized by specific objects and uh, symbolized by songs and dances and other elements become a part of a particular clan. Uh, and then uh, finally, the underlying theme, which is also a part of the critical existence scape, is what I term obligatory reciprocity. As a member of a clan, you cannot marry anyone on the same side. This sets up what I call the obligatory stream of relationship that is inescapable. The inescapable linkage is, is the creation of a sense of interdependence and it leads to the continuous stream of materials and support between intermarrying clans. So this underlying theme is very important as an underlying element to be thinking of going forward in terms of some of the events that occur, and that will be discussed in some other talks as well. So this then constitutes the Clinket cultural template, as we know, uh, as we've gone through, particularly important is the powerful identity with the clan and the house. 
So the contact periods can be conceived in uh, 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 this particular hierarchy. Um, from 1741 to 1867, there's an exploration period, um, mainly derived by Europeans and Americans, uh, Europeans in exploration. There's a sea otter fur trade period uh, undertaken from about 1787 to 1815. It, initially, it was British and Americans, then the Americans uh, dominated it. This then shifted after the demise of the um, <clears throat> of the sea otters to the terrestrial fur trade of, that I have bracketed into two divisions from 1815 to 1850, and then a second period from 1850 to 1867. Um, in addition to the British and the Americans, La Perouse appeared at, at uh, Latouille Bay in 1786, and uh, George Vancouver conducted a, a substantial um, uh, tour of southeastern Alaska. Um, the uh, particular ac uh, um, in encounters that are of, of, can be associated with the uh, exploration period are the bering chirigoff encounters and then the Ismailoff encounters. Those were particular intersections uh, associated with um, exploration by those parties. The Spaniards, uh, while they came uh, for a relatively short period of time, the written materials and the collection of objects are really quite remarkable the, uh, in the Spanish um, uh, accounts. And then as I mentioned, the French and the British as well. So on the Tlingit side, there are the so-called uh, the accounts of the coming of the first white men that were, have been handed down uh, through various um, generations down the story. Um, there is the northern account that's given by George Betts in one of the Sea uh, 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 Alaska uh, publications of the uh, Latuya Bay uh, engagement with whom in the exact date is not entirely clear, but that involved going out onto the vessels. And then there's a Southern account, much never been published in a serious fashion, um, given by John Darrow uh, about Bucarelli Bay, uh, and it is likely from 1779 or 1792 with the uh, Spaniards in that particular kind. There are similar themes in these first contact um, stories. Um, <clears throat> in, uh, particularly uh, seeing the offshore vessels as in the opening slide was initially as in the existence scape framed as most likely some form of the appearance of Yech. Particularly the white sails of the vessels make an initial um, uh, interpretation along that frame. However, then, in the George Betts account, Klinkus go out to the vessel after making a determination that this is something that could be approached, uh, whereas in the John Darrow account, the, uh, the uh, sailors or the men on the vessels come ashore. It's quite interesting how in the John Darrow account, the Klinkus interpreted the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the long ship with its paddles as a water beetle, a large water beetle coming um, to the shore. Uh, and then after that, the encounters certainly immediately reveal that these, are, these aren't something from some other realm. These are forms of human beings like other forms, Gunana or Simsians or other people, but they're in this particular. Uh, and then they, through the uh, encounters, uh, Various materials are given to them to consume, including rice, which is conceived in both cases as maggots, uh, and they were also both given this, um, uh, drinks of liquor, which uh, had an effect upon them, uh, a physical effect, which uh, in George Betts's account is stipulated, and um, uh, in uh, the Darrow account it is indicated as uh, uh, not good, did not, did not taste good. Um, then there are the uh, actual, uh, there are the um, accounts from the other side, and this is uh, the, one of the accounts has to do with the, the one of the initial uh, actual interactions from which we have an interesting thing is actually in 1741 from the Bering and Chirikov voyages. And um, in that particular voyage, Chirikov's vessel is the first to both make, make land in southeastern Alaska at Cape Chirikoff, which is on the outer coast uh, west of Prince of Wales Island, but also most significantly, um, uh, there was an interaction uh, north in the vicinity of Lysiansky Strait, 
where the Russians dropped uh, two of their longboats off to get water. Now, you'll, you've seen from the initial maps, these people were on vessel, on board the vessel from Kamchatka for over two months before they sighted land. So they were in extreme need of fresh water, some of which they got at Chirikov, and then um, they wanted to get other resources. Those two longboats disappeared. And this, of course, uh, has led to, led to a great deal of speculation on the European side as to what happened to them. Typically, the European accounts, which we see time and time again uh, over the course of history, was that these individuals were either killed by Klinget or that they were drowned as their vessels overturned in the straits. Subsequently, there was accounts from Mark Jacobs uh, who recounted uh, oral traditions indicating that those men had, in fact, jumped ship. And at least some of them were assimilated into Clinket society. Later on, uh, they moved southward. We don't know the exact locations. There are possible linkages to people in the, uh, in the west coast of Prince of Wales Island area where they be encountered. Fascinatingly, however, we do have a material piece, which is, but comes from a little bit further south. In 1774, when the Spaniards uh, encountered the uh, the Hadas offshore of uh, northern Haida Gwaii, they went out uh, and they brought with them a piece of a metal sword. And in the Spanish account, they indicate that that, metal, that piece of metal came from, from, the, from the Russians. And by that time, 1774, that piece could have only come from uh, a Russian source dating back to the 1741. So it still has mysterious elements, but it's one of the intriguing, one of those intriguing na narrative uh, kernels that exist in the contact uh, period. Now, Spanish exploration in Southeast initiated at uh, Sea Lion Cove on the outer coast of uh, Cruzoff Island in 1775. There was a very brief event in which the Spanish, again, anchored offshore, had traveled all the way from, um, uh, from Monterey Bay uh, and so wanted water. They went ashore at a stream where there was a Clinket uh, fish camp located. And there was a structure there with a palisade and the, and the uh, Spaniards went ashore on the opposite side from the Clinkets and they began to come down with their um, uh, water containers and to get wood. And when they went to do that, the Clinkets immediately came down from, from their house to the shore and they uh, res remonstrated against, told, told the Spaniards that they weren't to be taking any water from that stream or any, any wood. And there was a, a conflict over that. The Spaniards then offered them um, cloth and some clothing and, and there was two men met in a stream and the Spaniards handed off the cloth um, to, and the uh, clothing to the Clinket who returned and uh, that was the extent, basically, as near as I can tell from the accounts, of the physical interaction. The Clinket did not go on board that ship and it, it uh, left at that particular time and sailed back south. Um, from that particular uh, occurrence, um, some, uh, uh, the British trader uh, Dixon in 1787 came just to the north. Um, this is the 35-foot schooner with about 35 crewmen on it that, uh, that uh, um, the Sonora, that Bodegi Quadra sailed up into. It was a very primitive type of sailing vessel, not very, it couldn't tack, so it was uh, very, very difficult for them to, uh, to do that. And um, the uh, <coughs> Spaniards um, left, and, uh, uh, but uh, in 1787, just to the northeast, uh, this, this is where Sea Lion Cove is, and just to the northeast is, uh, uh, is called Port Lock Harbor. And that's where Dixon came and uh, landed to, as the first fur trader in southeastern Alaska. And uh, he noted uh, extensive pockmarks of smallpox on people older 12, 12 years of age. There were lots of people with the smallpox scars associated with the disease. He interpreted that as having been transmitted or transferred from the Spaniards in 1775. Uh, that's a very difficult 
claim and take uh, when you think through it in terms of what we know, but what we do know, obviously, from the observation is smallpox is already present in, in an early phase by the mid-1780s, uh, or late 1780s. What we don't know is uh, its further dissemination. The, um, the uh, demographer, anthropological demographer Robert Boyd, however, does place this as a time frame in which there was a substantial uh, significant initial die-off that is uh, undie, un, for the most part, undocumented. So then in 1779, the next phase of the Spaniards was coming into Bucareli Bay. And in Bucareli Bay, um, they uh, encountered, uh, fascinatingly again, as a kernel of, of, of important interaction, they came in right on the border of the Hadas and the Clinket. And they're anchored in one of the locations, two large vessels, a number of longboats vessels, and, and reading their accounts with an understanding that they're on the borderland between two peoples standing in at least a, a position of political tension, it's quite interesting to understand those dynamics, which were not understood by a lot of people when they, when they initially um, encountered those journals. So their longboats went out and uh, circulated throughout. You can see the tracing of it. They identified uh, three particular f uh, things that would be meet the standard of new. I showed you the fort that they went earlier uh, up on, and on that particular uh, referred to as La Rancheria. Their description is of uh, houses in which the paints of red and black appear on the house posts. So this is in 1779, so we know that that cultural practice, that's the first description that we have of any, of any um, European going into uh, a structure and in fact describing the existence of red and black, black paint in it, so very, very important. So that early um, 1779 appearance uh, led the Spaniards to place it on their regional maps. Here's a map of the entire west coast of North America from Monterey Bay through up through uh, Washington and Oregon and at the top there's uh, Bucarelli Bay and above it is, uh, is, above, above it is Sea Lion Cove. So this shows you the earliest kind of knowledge was coming from this particular part uh, of southeastern Alaska. Uh, and the uh, Spaniards wished to return and establish a major naval base in Bucareli Bay, but that never came to fruition because by that time they were well aware of the Russian expansion from the west and uh, they were intending to halt that and, and push their own settlements northward. Uh, 1791, we have another extraordinary uh, period of time. Um, the importance of the uh, Bucarelli Bay expedition is the, in 1779, is the length of time. They were in there over 30 days. So that set up, uh, and through that circuit of travel, they set up lots of interactions. And the Spaniards give the best descriptions of a whole host of things in terms of cultural uh, attributes. One of the most important of which I used in a legal document was that they set up a trade, a trade, um, little trade pl place there on shore where they would trade with the uh, think it in Haida, and it was clearly evident from their description of what was trade that they were receiving salmon. And in uh, the middle of May or the latter part of May to, re re to receive salmon means there's only one kind of salmon you're going to be receiving at that time, and that's trolled king salmon. So it was trolled king salmon used then to demonstrate aboriginal trolling for king salmon in a court case uh, associated with uh, uh, aspects of the salmon treaties that have occurred. Um, so that's, th these little times and places uh, can glean lots of information from them. So uh, Malaspina was in um, Yakutat Bay in 1791, again an extended uh, period of time for local exploration. Uh, <clears throat> we learn a lot about the location of the glacier at that particular time period. There were large numbers of um, Lincoln, who through time came to interact and, of course, engage in trade. One of the most fascinating elements to me of that particular account in the Malaspina, which doesn't appear in any of the, um, of the uh, Prince of, of the uh, Bucarelli Bay documents, is the recording of music. Uh, Malaspina's journals talk about music and the constant uh, flow of music from Clinkett's particular encounters at the outset, um, which they interpreted as songs of introduction and peace. 
Oh, thank you. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then that led to um, this particular re the creation of sheet music. Henke created sheet music from those, from those particular songs that he heard. And he pointed out that it was choral music. That means that there were different, um, different tones being used and it was under direction and they used percussion on the canoes. So it was a regular, um, it was a regular performance that was put on quite regularly for them in these interactions. So this is one of the fascinating elements, uh, the only place that I've ever seen in, a, in an uh, exploration journal talking about um, the, the musical side of, of Linket life. There were some uh, other interesting, um, oh, I, I wanted to um, briefly mention Bucarelli Bay, there was also an instance of two of the crew jumping ship which they knew they jumped ship. Two of, their, of the Spanish crew, who may have been indigenous people, I suspect, jumped ship and decided. And that goes back to the, if you go back and think about the, um, the Russian crewman jumping up in Lysiansky Sait, I can hear him. Who the hell wants to go back on board that? How long, how long are we gonna be back on board that vessel? What is a better, where are we gonna have a better chance for our lives going forward than getting the hell off of this ship? Excuse my language. But the uh, two indigenous parties jump ship in, in uh, Bucareli Bay. And of course, it's fascinating that in European accounts never will treat these things as people looking for a better life, getting away from it in these new contexts. But those, that's true. Uh, it did not occur in Yakutat, but in those other contexts it did. Trade was an uh, ongoing feature conducted by the elites. Um, there was a very fascinating um, event in which um, the Spaniards set up some um, equipment, astrola astrolabs to take some, some astronomical observations, and the Ixt came down in, uh, uh, in their clothing and sought to interrupt that activity. So there's a the existence scape was producing an interpretation of the events by the Spaniards to mobilize some kinds uh, of events, perhaps to the detriment of the Clinket. So this was a very uh, tension-filled encounter that occurred as well. Now across, uh, the Spaniards came back uh, to Bucareli Bay in 1792, but found virtually nobody there. And that may relate back to Boyd's notion that this is an early episode of epidemic spread that is basically un unnotarized. Now, this piece is always, I could just sit here on five minutes. This is an object that the Spaniards collected. Um, and this particular object is in their collections back in Spain. And it uh, causes me to uh, really um, feel badly that these objects have never been able to be returned uh, back to Hlinket territory and also as well as Russian objects and, um, and British objects for the people to be able to see. But if you just resonate on this particular object, recognizing this comes from the very earliest period of interaction representing uh, the artistry already uh, so incredibly apparent in what, what was um, there. So then the, this is followed by a maritime fur trade in which the Americans uh, come in and the British and they begin to take uh, sea otters. And during this trade, the Clinket uh, demand is uh, uh, for iron initially, but they soon have enough. Uh, as the outsiders introduce tobacco, that gets um, more in demand. Then the most important features, arms, ammunition, and powder. And initially rejected, but the American traders uh, utilized rum, which became assimilated um, detrimentally into uh, certain aspects of Clinket ceremonialism later on. The food is rice, flour, and molasses. Then blankets, the incorporation of blankets, they came to be a currency and for different kinds of exchange. Uh, and then utensils, pots in chi and China. They also learned about, of course, things like tables and chairs and beds, things like that also, and status differentiating materials, especially clothing from the Europeans became sought after, hats, beads, medals. And then this quite interesting object is, of course, this is the, the tinna. So the European vessels carried sheets of copper to cover their bows to keep them from being penetrated by worms. And those large sheets of copper then became 
a part of the wealth system of the Northwest Coast people and turned in by the uh, turned into the tinas that we see um, uh, on display here. There, the blankets became part of the culture as they were adop adapted for uh, ceremonial purposes as well, as well as daily purposes. And the Europeans wanted furs initially, sea otters and fur seals, later land mammals. Then they wanted food and they traded for fish, game and birds. And then uh, uh, apparently the Americans and the British were interested in sex. But the Spanish were, Spanish were quite clear in terms of keeping that available. Those were typically slave women would be offered. And then a variety of souvenirs and developed new forms of artisanry and art craft in those areas. This is an interesting example of a Haida woman in her um, hybrid, the hybridization occurring in the context of uh, these kinds of trade that was going on. We can still see that she's wearing the labret and she has facial painting. Um, but she has adapted uh, some aspects of European clothing. Note as well the bracelets and the um, anklets made of copper were, that were widespread and became adapted as well. So these practices uh, had differential um, impacts uh, as individuals um, accommodated and made these things aware. One important thing was, the, of course, the, the over Harvest, uh, Klinkett sought desperately to keep the Russians from bringing Aleutics in, but after the Aleutics began to penetrate with the Russians, the sea otter population uh, diminished dramatically, particularly, for example, in, in Sitka Sound, and that, that diminished the opportunities for Klinkett's to sustain that trade and develop wealth. There were no large-scale displacements. Um, the seasonal, seasonal round went uh, forward pretty similarly. Um, there were, however, uh, lots of conflicts between the Euro Americans and the Clinkets, and the Boston trader, the dean of them, John Sturgis, in the mid-1850s, said that conflict was incited by Euro-American behavior. It was the frontier business profit motive. If you can't get what you can by trade, use that violence to, to lay your hands on it. So um, these then... Uh, uh, the manifestations in terms of how these were played out regionally is interestingly uh, displayed in this famous painting from an interaction of Vancouver uh, with uh, both Clinkets and Haidas in what he referred to, uh, and you can look on his map, and, and it's on the east, west side of Revilla Island, it's called Traders Point, and it's a location in which the Clinket attempted to uh, obtain arms because they tried to trade with Vancouver, but Vancouver wasn't a trader, and they were at a disadvantage because the Haida on the outside were getting the arms. So this sets up imbalances in terms of the trade relationships. And in that particular case, the Clinkets needed those arms to rebalance the uh, equation in, in their interactions. How, what were the impacts of the uh, fur trade? Some scholars have called it enrichment, where metals allowed new construction, larger houses, elaboration of art, expanded ceremonials. It was without control or coercion from outsiders. Others have seen it as devastation. With over 50% of the population uh, gone by 1860s um, due to epidemics, the uh, rising dependency on arms, metals, and later alcohol uh, led to an increase in stratification, um, particularly powerful individuals uh, and violence increased conflict and enslavement and sacrifices. Well, the establishment of the Russians uh, at Sitka in uh, 1799 was on, on this particular landscape, a sketch from 1793, uh, watercolor that shows where they were. So uh, that led, of course, to the, um, the destruction of Sitka. I'm gonna leave this, uh, pass through this material because this will be treated in another lecture. But this was a, a major um, point uh, of contact. Uh, leading the Clinkets to uh, have to retreat from Sitka proper for a period of time, also setting up some dynamic interrelations between the clans. So clan relationships are also affected, uh, not only regional relationships by these things. At Yakutat, uh, the uh, Russians established a post in 1796, and through their actions of appropriating access to salmon resources, it led to the... Um, Clinket resistance, which uh, led to the destruction of Yakutat in 1805-06. And the discussion is that the Clinkets attempted to mobilize a westward um, 
movement to drive the, the Russians out of the region, and that, did, that tra failed uh, to uh, materialize. So th throughout this time, we see the, that the, the controlling of trade, um, and by limiting, the, bottling up the Russians, that led to the, the fur trade uh, being conducted uh, primarily by um, the Americans and the British, um, and with the establishment of the Hudson's Bay Company Fort at uh, Fort Simpson in 1832, uh, a new avenue and, uh, became available uh, for access to the superior goods that the Americans and British were able to supply over what the Russians were able. Disease impacts, as I mentioned, led to overall loss. An important development um, of exposure uh, was to Russian Orthodoxy, at Sitka specifically, but there are Russian Orthodox impacts in Angoon and Huna, uh, but nothing in the south. And this Bishop Venyaminov uh, began the process and he created an orthography and he also attempted to utilize vaccination, but uh, the, the, the deep suspicion of the Russians um, led, the, led the Sitka Klinka to uh, probably only maybe 20% became vaccinated and the um, ICST-led counter movements to uh, drive out uh, the Russians using the, the disease element. Now the terrestri terrestrial fur trade from 1815 to 1850 was uh, led to the rise of particularly powerful individuals. Um, the Hudson's Bay Company had a short-lived post on Taku Inlet and also uh, at uh, Wrangell. Uh, um, but this, uh, the Nanayi Chief Sheikhs was, was able to f fight, uh, control the relationship and basically keep the Russians and the uh, British at bay. Important to recognize in 1834-38 was a treaty which gave the British the right to the mainland. It was the strangest territorial thing you ever see to trade along the mainland all the way up the coast and around out to Cape Spencer. So that became, there became particular locations up, up Lynn, Lynn, um, Lynn Canal at uh, Pyramid Harbor uh, on the east side of uh, Icy Straits at Swanson Bay where Hudson's Bay Boats would come and uh, clinkets would go and trade with them. One of the fascinating features uh, of this is period beginning um, in uh, actually, and let me return to this in a minute, that's the Hudson's Bay Coin, is the wealth generation side of this. And this shows the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial vigor and the ability to turn this object, the, the woven blanket, into an object of demand the marketing, if you would, of, which continues to this day of clinket artistry so that these objects of manufacture the robes became desirous all the way down the coast, down to and are held by populations. I don't know if I've ever seen Salish mobilize this, but certainly other populations throughout British Columbia gain access to these things. Shakes played those people off. In the second period of the fur trade, we find uh, the Clinket uh, leader, Khatlacher Shartridge uh, uh, of the Chilkat Kaguantan, who uh, he controlled the fur trade to the interior uh, from the village of Klukwan. And uh, they traded uh, up to a place that uh, became known as Fort Selkirk, where the Hudson's Bay Company attempted to establish a, uh, a fur trade post. And uh, according to Joe Hotch, the Clinkets went, went up there three times and told him to leave. And on the third time, when they didn't leave, they burned the place down. And that effectively controlled that fur trade then for the Chilkats by eliminating the Hudson's Bay Company. And this is the uh, sketch by the uh, American uh, military reconnoir of the uh, remains at Fort Selkirk. I should point out that nobody was killed when the Hudson's Bay Company post was burned down. They were all told to leave. Um, uh, but I believe the Chilkats took the furs back with them when they came back from that. Uh, the, the great leader Khotlach also did this map, um, which uh, uh, showed the, the territory in 1869. He and his two wives prepared this map for the American George Davidson. So the uh, Clinkets in foreign lands, I find an interesting little nugget that doesn't, and that is that uh, they went elsewhere with the idea of obtaining information to be able to utilize. Uh, in 1796, the, act, the nephews of the Akatat leader went to Kodiak, acquiring language and cultural practice there, and then assuming coming back and 
being a part of the uh, activities to drive the Russians out in 1805. Uh, and this story here about the Haniga youth is not known anywhere. Uh, is never spoken of. So that when the Boston men came in, they traded especially amongst the Southern Clinkets. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, one, on one of those traders, we don't find it in their accounts, took some uh, Hinya boy back with them to Boston where he spent several years and then he returned back and he became a speaker, of, excellent speaker of English and understanding of American culture. He took his uh, people from Haniga, which is a village north of Cloak, and they would traded Hudson's Bay where he was known as Haniga Joe. And the Hudson's Bay Company reports say that he was, the, the guy says, this, this Indian speaks the best English I've ever heard anyone speak. Well, it's because of being at a distance. Later on, 20 years later, the uh, HBC leader, um, uh, uh, George Simpson, he was hired as the pilot for George Sim Simpson's cruise all the way up to Sitka. It was Haniga Joe who led that. Now, the creation of Victoria and the uh, tra trading of the British in that territory led to the uh, emergence of Victoria as a great uh, city. And the Clinkets began traveling down there. But uh, in uh, cake events are another fascinating kernel to be able to uh, look at, and that is the, um, they traveled to Puget Sound in 1855 for various purposes. They were camped out and the U.S. military decided they were outside Indians, so they told them to leave. They didn't. They came and they bombed them. And uh, uh, over, over 10 cake individuals were killed, including two, le two leaders. Two years later, the cakes returned to that, to that area in 1857, and they went to the customs office and they beheaded uh, George Eby, who was the U.S. Uh, customs man, and they returned back to cake with his head. His head was on display in Cake uh, for at least two or three years. And uh, finally, the U.S. Navy um, convened with the Hudson's Bay Company and was able to negotiate the return of his head. And after it was re returned, it was buried with the rest of Eby's body uh, on Whidbey Island at what is called Eby's Landing today. Um, there are often two major overlooked additions. One is horticulture, the incorporation of potatoes and turnips became a part of subsistence and a part of trade, uh, become trade with the uh, Europeans, uh, and then writing. Uh, they learned about script and the recording of speech onto paper, and this was a, adapted to the socio-political order of interacting between uh, the outsiders and the Clinkets as well as later on to the establishment of political allegiance as well. Of course, Russian Orthodoxy as well. These papers became uh, given by leaders, and these are examples in Angoon of how those papers were then actually emblazoned on the house uh, in terms of the recognition of the individuals. So in 1862, uh, the Russian-American observation was that their nature and qualities remain unchanged. The Clinkets are savage and ferocious people at the formative stage of those primitive peoples without any subordination one to the other and united only in common needs by customary rules according to kin. The people frequently outnumber our establishment here at the readout, 10 to one. Outside the fortress, our position and mastery are maintained only by our overwhelming material power, our intellect and our moral qualities. We can all laugh here at the last sense, have a good laugh at, the, at this bloviation. But at any rate, in conclusion, why did the Clinket remain uncivilized, unchanged and independent? well-developed trading skills from traditional times, well-developed mi military skills to a point, the problem of creating alliances is, uh, uh, appeared more than once. They were excellent readers of situations and contexts, learning quickly about the new circumstances. They were the beneficiaries of competitive trade. They were able to obtain arms from Americans in abundance who wanted to stop the Russians. The Americans had their own geopolitical agenda so that they could use cannons, muskets, and ammunition. They protected their territories by killing Aleutic and Aleut when they entered their territory to kill sea otters, and they destroyed their competition as at Fort Selkirk. They had a strong identity to maintain who they were and to be autonomous and self-governing, and there was no comprador class to be bought off. Um, the Russians tried to, to create the great toy on Michael Colhane and Sitka. He was probably sort of said, oh yeah, okay, well, let's get on with it. 
They were also the beneficiaries of the Russians were not a society that engaged in settler colonialism. So they did not experience the force of settler colonialism that impacted Eastern North America, Australia, and South Africa. All of these combined to tell us why the Clinkets uh, remained uncivilized, unchanged, and independent. Thank you very much. There's time for questions, I guess, however the... Oh, go ahead. Thanks, Dr. Langdon, thank you. Well, we have some questions uh, online, as well as if anybody has any questions in the audience, there is a microphone here. Um, but because somebody already asked a question on the live stream, I think we'll uh, get to that first. Um, Milky on YouTube, a user asked, will there be sources provided after uh, this presentation? And do you have, would you be willing to share any, sure, any well, of the bibliography? A list of vol volumes, yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions in the audience? Are there any questions online that are coming in now? Well, do we have a question here, Chuck? <laughs> One thing that's come out is, is that the Russians, the Clinket viewed the Russians as wanting to turn them into servants and slaves and, and not treating them as, as human beings and, and as people they could interact with. Um, so th that also was a factor. Could you comment on that as a factor in Clinket interactions with the Russians that they, they never really liked them and, and uh, thought that the Russians really weren't ever going to uh, change in their attitudes? Oh, yes, that certainly is one of the of very clear elements is the, uh, the refusal to treat uh, people as uh, sovereigns and e equals in those situations. Uh, you know, the Russians were trying to replicate their models with the uh, Anangan and Lutuk and they uh, met, came into a situation in which that simply was not going to be possible for a ver various reasons, but certainly the Clinkets. Um, particularly the last point about uh, when the, they tried, and it's very clear in the statements when they gave the authority to Michael, Mikhail Kulhan to be the, the chief toyon of Sitka, in the, uh, that he was to exercise all jurisdiction and bring it. People just ignored it. I mean, they, he, he had no effect and uh, no clinket was going to uh, I think, uh, be party to that particular apparatus. The strength of the identity, um, the recognition of the heritage, the desire to be autonomous, and that continues on into this day and this time and across the American divide, where Americans want to turn them into something cultural, culturally and religiously different as well. And again, we find that, that same thing. But you're absolutely right, that is part of certainly uh, where that resistance is going to be be uh, be expressed in, in response to clink, uh, Russian behaviors. Thank you. We have another question online uh, from Brian Richardson. Is there evidence of Hawaiians or other Pacific Islanders in the area during this time? Well, that's a fascinating um, question. Yes, that Hawaiians came um, as crew on HBC ships. And they were also crew uh, or uh, at the outposts in both uh, Fort Simpson and at, uh, uh, for, uh, at uh, uh, Wrangell for a period of time. There were Hawaiians um, that resulted from the British um, interactions in the uh, Hawaiian Islands uh, as well. So uh, the question then of how Hawaiians may have then moved into Clinket society is, is un settled, I believe that, that there is the possibility, and I certainly have, I've heard certain oral traditions about Hawaiians becoming uh, members of, of Clinket society, but I don't have any um, absolute firm uh, evidence on that all, until later in the American period, I know for sure, but in the early period of the fur trade, I don't, I don't know of that per se. Thank you. 
I'm not seeing any further questions online. Uh, does anybody else have any questions in the audience for an excellent presenter? Well, thank you for joining. Uh, this was our first virtual and in-person lecture series, so I understand that there were some issues with the audio at the beginning, but we have our great media team here, all produced in-house, who was able to fix, uh, quickly fix that. So I just want to thank the, our presenter, Dr. Steve Langdon, as well as our excellent media team. Um, and I also want to make a pitch for donations. So. Sea Alaska Heritage you know, receives grant funding, but there are many programs that are unfunded by grants. Uh, we produce Celebration, which is coming up this upcoming June, June 8th through 11th, 2022. Donations entirely fund Celebration. If you'd like to contribute for Celebration for the Baby Raven Reads program that was just recently not refunded uh, in our latest round of grant awards, or any of our other culture, language, and educational programs, you can contribute. We have donation uh, envelopes here in the uh, clan house, as well as you can contribute online at sealaskaheritage.org slash donate. Thank you. Thanks, and we'll see you on Thursday for our next presentation, which is um, Misha Jackson, who's going to be presenting on uh, Southeast Alaska Native history, education history. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the Alaska Heritage Institute and all of our employees, uh, we want to thank you for. Uncivilized. Yes, yes. <laughs> for recognizing this uncivilized place <laughs> independent. We <laughs> really appreciate uh, you coming here and knowledge. Gonna see.